Hi gang, uh, John again. Thanks for checking out the channel. We have another episode today, and today we're actually going to talk a little bit more about shooting film, um, which I have found to be really important in making me both a better photographer and as well as enjoying photography as a whole. Um, we're kind of going to go over today a little bit of what maybe you should look for in a film camera. Now these are all pretty reasonable, and we did a previous video on what wound up being my choice for my first film camera, it was a Nichromat. Um, so today we're gonna go over a few more models that might be good. These are all very reasonably priced. Probably all of them you can get for under 150 US dollars. Um, they all offer something that um, will help the, sh the uh, film shooting experience uh, be a little easier maybe, or a little bit easier to adapt to, but still maintain enough manual portions of it where you can uh, actually kind of feel like a, a, a photographer or feel like it's a different experience than your, uh, than your digital camera, which you kind of point in the right direction and, and it does a lot of the thinking for you. So uh, a couple things you want to look for in my opinion, and I think the first thing you want to look for is make sure the camera's got some kind of light meter. Um, depending on how complex the camera is, uh, will we'll make a difference on how, com how complex the meter and the shutter system are. Uh, some of them are a lot more basic, um, like Nikkor like Matt, uh, a Leica M6 is another one with a very basic um, light meter system. Now, I'm not advocating you spend $1,500 on a camera body, um, which is pretty much what a Leica M6 will get you or will cost you. Uh, that's not it at all. You can you can get a great alternative at 35 millimeter for far, far less than that. So we're going to take a couple look at a couple models today, uh, including one that has become actually my favorite camera. Um, and that one I will do first, it's a Minolta X700. It's a great camera. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all the features and dials because quite frankly, there's a thousand videos on this that review this camera. It's a classic camera. It is, in my, my mind, the perfect gateway camera uh, between shooting film and shooting digital or shooting digital and then shooting film because it little, gives you a little bit of everything. It's, um, it has kind of a, a more modern feel. It's made, made in the 80s, which I suggest you buy a film camera that was either made in the 60s, 70s, or 80s. 70s or 80s is probably the, the, the best preference because you get a little bit of electronics in there, a uh, metering system, and sometimes you can get a pro, different program modes, aperture priority, a full program mode in some of them, um, which helps make the experience a little bit, little bit better. But all of them are going to be manual focus lenses. This has a 50 on it, which is really all you need in the film camera. Nothing more. We don't have to do anything crazy with these. We're just shooting to enjoy the whole process and to get a taste of what shooting film is like. Um, so the Minolta X700 is a fabulous deal. And to me, it's my favorite 35 millimeter SLR camera. Um, at least the, of the ones that I've shot, which is actually that list is kind of growing here. Um, and I, I really, really enjoy this and I can't recognize or recognize it, recommend it anymore. Um, they're pretty plentiful. They made a lot of them. They sold a lot of them. Um, Minolta is sort of, uh, actually, believe it or not, was sort of known as a, as a pretty quality um, film camera company and it's only when digital came around that they really didn't kind of keep up and I think Sony absorbed them I'm pretty sure I'm not sure not 100% sure but I'm pretty sure they did so Minolta X700 excellent excellent big first film camera all right that's number one the second one we're gonna have is is the quintessential student camera it's the Pentax K1000 these are also extremely plentiful there's a ton of these out there uh, a little bit more basic in its operation than the X700, um, but it doesn't mean that it make it any worse. It's, as you can see, it's not quite as fancy on the top plate. It's a shutter speed dial, aperture you set on the lenses of all these, all these cameras, uh, pretty basic film advance, set the speed, point the camera at the subject, get it in focus and snap the picture. Uh, there is a light meter in here also, which actually is a pretty reliable one I've found. Uh, Pentex K7, K1000 is another uh, excellent first choice and a good way to get into film. Now, we're going to move to maybe the most popular SLR camera of all time, uh, the Canon AE-1. This one's the program version, which basically means the program mode will pretty much do everything for you, um, which is nice. Uh, especially if you're just getting into it and you can kind of ease your way into using some of the more advanced modes 
uh, aperture priority and shutter pro or in a full manual. Both of these uh, setups, the program and the AE-1 are everywhere, everywhere. In the early 80s, these cameras were the camera for consumer level photographers and even some professionals to have. And there's a good reason for that. They're pretty durable. The light meter is very good in it. Uh, the lenses are dynamite. The Canon FD lenses are great. There's a lot of us out there that even shoot those on our, some of our mirrorless cameras. I have an adapter for my Fuji uh, X-Pro1 that I will occasionally use uh, this, this exact 50 millimeter lens on. Uh, it's a wonderful entryway into uh, film also. And you can see the top plate there, nothing too crazy. Uh, this one has the action grip, which is actually sort of a feature here. It screws on. It's like a little extra grip for the camera. I would, I would kind of look for that if you're looking for one, actually. Uh, and then the final one we're going to talk about today is the Nikon EM. This one's a little bit different because it literally, you kind of focus it and shoot it. And that's pretty much it. There is no shutter speed dial, nothing. It's either auto B90, which basically is a, a shutter speed or a shutter speed that you can use without a battery, um, and a bulb mode, and that's pretty much it. Um, it's a it's actually a very good camera, and Nikon Nikon glass is dynamite. So this is really not a bad option, and it's going to be cheaper than the other three. You can get these for a hundred dollars or less in really good condition on Etsy. I would highly recommend Etsy. Etsy seems to be um, a hub for some film uh, film camera shooters and some film camera companies that are selling some of these vintage stuff and, the, and they seem to be in really good shape and a lot of times the light seals are changed which is really important um, and uh, I recommend Etsy you can just punch in film cameras or classic cameras or something like that and get a bunch of shops that are selling these things you can also get this cool old vintage hippie straps that go with it too which are actually kind of nice uh, there's a couple of them floating around here um, so there's a couple things you want to check for when you look at this you want to do a couple do a few little tests very basic ones a make sure you got a good battery um, and then fire the camera at every shutter speed I mean you're not gonna be able to measure it exactly but try to try to gauge by ear if it's close use the slower shutter speeds sometimes to start and work your way back up to uh, up to a thousandth or two thousandth of a second or, or even four thousandths of a second uh, depending on the camera body that you're working with or the mileage you're working with um, check the second thing you want to check the film advance open the back look around make sure that the dial resets a lot of cameras have problems with the dial not resetting when you close the camera so if you stopped at frame 36 it's gonna stay in frame 36 it'll never go back to zero which is not a good thing check the light seals um, light seals are actually pretty easy to replace if you do a DIY or D DIY sorry <laughs> DIY setup um, you buy some foam at a craft store, cut it to the appropriate width, and you can, with a little bit of rubbing alcohol, you can get the old ones out. Um, kind of scrape them out with a toothpick or something. You can get the old ones out and replace them. Uh, it's really not that complex of a, of a thing, but if you're going to buy a camera, make sure the seals are good then. You might as well. Someone else can do the same thing. Why should you do that work if you don't have to? Um, and then the lenses, a couple things, actually. One, make sure that they they move between f-stops smoothly um, in most cases canon fds are a little bit tough because they really have to be hooked up to the camera to actually see it open or close but nikon glass pentax and minoltas you can open and close them freely uh, here's an old pentax lens you can see that it's at f22 now you just want to open it and that's wide open at 1.7 and then check the actual blades themselves for uh, green oil or if there's any hang up or clicking, look at the glass pretty closely. You can bring a flashlight, kind of shine it through the glass at a little bit of an angle and you can see, obviously you don't want any glass with any fungus or haze, that's an immediate no sale. Um, it's cleanable, but you'd have to dismantle the lens and then put it back together, which is not as easy as it sounds. Um, it's easier just to find some cleaner glass. Um, like I said, Etsy's, Etsy, Etsy, I'm stumbling over my words today. Sorry, guys. Um, Etsy is an excellent place I found, and I've bought actually a number of film cameras in the last few months here. Um, I'm absolutely hooked on it and love it. 
Uh, to start, I'd start with Etsy. Uh, Craigslist in the U.S. here is not a bad option, but a lot of times you get someone who had a camera in grandma's closet that was up there for 35 years and they have no idea whether it works or not. Uh, you don't really need to do that unless you can get it super, super cheap and be prepared that it might not function. So if you're up for that and if you think you're pretty handy with some of this stuff and knock yourself out, I would recommend getting a camera that's fully functional and works uh, cosmetically. It can look pretty good. These cameras are built like tanks for the most part. There's a few of them. Uh, the X700s have been known to have a few uh, glitches with the electronics after a while, but it's pretty quick to figure that out. If you put a battery in there, it either won't work um, or it'll be all out of whack as far as the uh, inside the viewfinder, you'll see the meter and it just won't function. So that should be a no-sale too. So this video, hope this little video helps. And uh, please in the comments below, let me know if you've had any experience with uh, shooting film or, or looking for cameras you might be able to add to this video. Lord knows there's a ton of variables. I tried to just go over the most basic ones here without the video getting too long. Um, and I really, really, really believe that once you guys start doing it, you'll get hooked on it. And we're also going to take a look in upcoming episodes on dark rooms and developing film and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really, really a lot of fun. And it, it kind of, to me, brings back the art and photography a little bit. And I think it's something that you guys will really enjoy if you give it a shot. So uh, if you like what we're, you do, we're doing here, please subscribe, hit the like button, uh, share if you want. Um, and also, please don't be afraid to leave comments below, negative, positive, whatever, at least you're watching. And that's the part of the, part of the job or my job here or the point here. And um, I'll try to get back to as many as I can. And uh, until next time, guys, uh, thank you much and happy shooting. Bye. <music>